everyone. Uh, I'm data scientist at Sixth. Uh, I'm part of an LP team, and today I would like to talk about uh, evaluation of applications that use LLMs inside. And our agenda will be the following. First, we will understand what are LLM applications. We will talk about evaluation, some approaches, levels. Then we switch to observability tools. That's great to have. Uh, then some demo, and we will end up with a conclusion. First, let's talk about LLM applications. And of course, any kind of software that uses LLMs, calls LLMs to solve some tasks, it's LLM application. So I have a question to you guys. Uh, uh, do you already implement some LLM applications as POC or on production? Can you raise your hand? Quite a lot of people, everyone works in that field. Who of you has LLM application on production? Low amount, yeah. Who of you is doing some kind of evaluation of LLM applications? Also quite a lot. Nice. So let's talk about applications uh, at sixth. So first case, it's about customer support. I will use it as examples uh, over the whole presentation. That's why I will talk about it a bit later on the next slide. As for the rest, uh, contract information extraction, uh, we, uh, we have some partners with whom we have some contracts, and we would like to track all the information, conditions, uh, some numbers that we have uh, in these contracts in a common system, and we would like to make it as automatic as possible, and for that we employ LLMs. Also, for our employees, we have internal tools, something like chatbots, that are used uh, by almost all employees on a daily basis, uh, like for composing emails, making summaries, uh, asking questions on. Of course, we use some third party tools, like for code generation, I guess everyone does now. And we also uh, work uh, towards service quality assessment when we have some reviews from customers and we uh, do some sentiment analysis and use these results. Um, and we have a lot of other POCs actually inside company, a lot of plans and uh, that I can talk about, but first let's focus about customer support. So uh, here we have just some general illustration how how our system works for customer support. Uh, we have a customer who has some issue with the car, with a car rental company, sixth. So it, it could be uh, car rental, car sharing. So whatever customer comes to us, usually he or she sends requests. It could be over email uh, or a call. Uh, in this system, we are focused on emails. So this request comes to our customer support platform. And then uh, some kind of classic classification of case happens. We understand what that case about, can we process it or not, and so on. What kind of uh, case is it? Uh, some kind of hierarchical classification happens, and we do it inside LLM application. Also, for some of the cases, we generate summaries, and for other cases, we can generate uh, some reply suggestions. And then, uh, summaries and replies, they're shown to support agent. Uh, why? Uh, why does agent need them? Because they speed up work of agent. Uh, some of emails that comes to us, they ca can be pretty long uh, on some topics and really reading such emails, uh, it requires time. That's why having summary that is properly structured uh, with all the facts in chronological order with some extra information like identifiers, um, some sentiment scores, so on. It's really useful for for business operations and customer support. Also about uh, reply that suggested. It also might be used quite frequently uh, for some of the use cases uh, because uh, support agent can compose response from these uh, replies. And of course, uh, this system is not uh, directly customer facing, so it faces towards our internal employee support agent now. 
And of course, we follow all the regulations, GPDR, and we take care of uh, customer data, keep it safe, and so on. Uh, the next we will talk about evaluation. In order to do proper evaluation, you need uh, some metrics, come up with them, some data, it could be some data set uh, that you collect, or it could be some production data that you have on the fly, and you can use it also for evaluation. Uh, there are two levels how to do evaluation. It's end-to-end, -end, when you have some product feature, in our case of customer support, it's summaries or uh, replies. So, and you can do relation as end-to-end -end approach. So you have some input, it's like customer mail, some other data, and you have output, summary or replies, and you relate that on some business metrics, for example, or business criteria. Also, you can go deeper inside summaries or replies inside your features uh, th that your product has. Uh, so, for example, in sc case of summaries, uh, you have some task, tasks that you do. It's, it's some sentiment analysis, uh, identify extraction, uh, some structured summary, and so on. And you can do evaluation on that level as well. And ideally, you need to, do, to evaluate both, actually. And why do you need evaluation? Of course, if you work with some prototype, you do something in notebooks, uh, it's very simple, you just, just start. Of course, you can use your eyes, and with your eyes you can check everything, and it works pretty well in simplest cases, but when your product uh, becomes mature, you switch to MVP, you, you are more concerned about quality, and in this case, uh, evaluation comes to the first place. And you, first, you need to establish some baseline, you need to understand all the metrics that you selected, uh, what's your current state, and then you can enhance something in logic. Either it could be task level, some prompts, uh, you can compare which prompts is better, or you can compare which techniques is better to use, should you switch to fine tuning at some tasks that doesn't work properly, and you can apply different other techniques and evaluation that is properly set up, it helps you uh, to do it, actually. And quality checks, it, important because your product, it exists in some changing environment, it constantly changes, uh, user behavior can change, uh, some data changes, if you rely on third-party models, these model providers, they also can change something, they can change APIs, whatever, so, and eternally, also you modify your product, and that's why quality checks that are done on a regular basis, uh, through regression tests, for example, or continuous evaluation on product, it's really important. And if you do so, actually, you follow data-driven, or people call it metric-driven, evaluation-driven approach. And, of course, you should do, ideally, two kinds of evaluation. So it's offline, uh, when you prepare some data set, data set, it's called golden data set, you do regression tests on it, it's fine. Also, when you do some research, you also prepare some data sets to relate whether this prompt, this, tasks, this task works or not, and so on. And for online evaluation, you can either sample some of your uh, online inputs, outputs that you have in real time, almost real time, in, in the ways that you implement. And then you can do continuous monitoring by computing some metrics on the fly and putting them to the dashboard with some alerts, so on. Or you can do another way, for example, you know that with LLMs, um, you never know whether they work or not, because they're stochastic, they can work in 99% of cases out of 100, and something happens, and of course, you can set up some filtering process, you can filter out inappropriate um, generations that you have, or you can do some retrial, so you can organize uh, what you need, actually. And for that, you need also to evaluate either at task level or at the whole end-to-end -end pipeline and to do it on the fly. <laughs> and also, when people start evaluating in their projects, they usually start with human approach. They use some QAs, domain experts. They can also rely on their customers because customers can also send some feedbacks. And, but this approach is not so scalable, you know, and you can't uh, ask people to relate everything what you change. 
usually on only some major changes and all evaluations can be done just on a regular basis it's a part of uh, life cycle and it's quite expensive you know that's why ideally you need to employ some kind of automatic evaluation as well uh, you can use different methods for that and some of them we will cover in the next slides and of course it would be great also to mix at least two kinds of relations. And what we did, we did that at sixth. So we have QAs, who uh, they special QAs, domain specific. They evaluate uh, the quality of our uh, responses to customers. And they also evaluate uh, at feature level what we generate, summaries, replies, in our, in our customer support case. And uh, they do it on some sample of production data. And also, we have regression tests on some golden data set, again, to ensure that nothing breaks, that quality doesn't go down on any change that we uh, apply. And we have automatic uh, online uh, evaluation that to filter out uh, bad responses. It's, and our fallback, uh, that's, so when it happens, for now, we simply doesn't generate summary or reply, and support agent just works on, on the, uh, like they did before us, actually. But you can implement retry logic in this case as well. And evaluation approaches would cover some the most popular and uh, how they were changing. Like the first obvious approach is to use LLM as a judge. You can ask a large language model to evaluate as human. And for that, uh, you need to come up with some prompt. Here I have example of prompt from LangChain uh, that is uh, used to evaluate uh, unlabeled uh, inputs and submissions when you don't have ground truth. And here example, uh, we provide some input. It's a question, uh, with, uh, like what is the best place to work in Munich? And the answer is uh, Olympic Park. And criteria, we also provide criteria description. Here it's uh, harmfulness. And we ask model to evaluate on a scale yes, no, whether it's harmful or not. Uh, but you can uh, make such prompts on your own. Instead of yes or no, you can uh, use some integer scale, like from 1 to 3, from 1 to 5, for example. Or there are ways uh, when you can compare, do comparison, pairwise comparison between uh, to alternative outputs, for example, it's also possible. So there are different tricky ways, and you can employ LLM for that. But unfortunately, it uh, prunes uh, to biases. I guess you heard that uh, LLMs are quite biased. Uh, for example, they can select always the longest answer, answer that was generated by this model itself or with the same style. Or it could be um, it could be that uh, it selects the first answer, for example, constantly so on. And th there are some techniques how to fight against these biases, like you can swap uh, answers. If you ask to do comparison, for example, you can swap them. Or you, you can uh, do some repetitive uh, evaluation, like you can repeat with some temperature several times and then uh, select the majority, or you can employ several models. And general recommendations also would be uh, to limit scale on which you do evaluation, because if it's scale from 1 to 10, obviously, in the most cases, it won't work properly. Uh, but if you do smaller, like binary classification, yes, no, 0, 1, or something one, like 1, 3, and ideally, if you describe the meaning for each uh, level of score, uh, it might work better. And uh, of course, another disadvantage is might be expensive, depending of, on impl implementation. And uh, if, if you're concerned about that, especially if you evaluate the whole production data, you can um, come up with some tricks, like you can use smaller models, uh, assumption, or you can use cheaper models, like GPT-4.0 or you GPT-3.5, for example, for these cases. But you need uh, to increase quality for that. For example, you can use a uh, few short prompting when you provide some examples or other techniques. Also, uh, there is a framework, it's called GEVAL, uh, that uses auto COT, some weighted sum scoring, and we will talk about that also on the next slide. 
So this framework, it was uh, created by uh, Microsoft specialists and actually it uh, uses two steps. The first one, uh, you provide some task description. You provide a uh, description of criteria. Here it's co coherence from one to five. You ask to evaluate model. And you ask uh, first model to uh, generate some steps. Because a chain of thoughts, it's prone if you provide some steps to the model. It's called chain of thoughts. It works uh, uh, usually better because uh, you um, you ask model to follow these steps as algorithm and people like call it engineering approach, you give some model time to think. So it ju not just jumps with the answer that like stochastic machine just g generates, it also follows some steps because it can uh, describe them, for example, in reasoning parts, and if it describes them, it means it does some kind of reasoning. And uh, you can either provide your own such steps, or like in this G eval framework, you ask to generate them, uh, depending on descriptions. And then uh, you provide, you make a prompt in, to which you insert some input. Here it's an article, some output, it's summary, all the stuff from the left, and you ask model to output uh, some values. And uh, you can do it in a form filling way, and then uh, you can use uh, output probabilities, log props that model provide you, or you can use, if it doesn't provide, you can uh, do a repetitive evaluation, like it was for GPT-4 before they implemented uh, log props. Uh, you can do a repetitive evaluation and then compute uh, uh, some averages. And we, when you do so, you get some weighted uh, some score. It, it's not just a integer, it's a, it's a, a decimal value, and it's better because when you then compare your scores with the human evaluations, usually you use uh, rank correlation, and for rank correlation, it's better to reduce ties uh, number of equal values, actually. And uh, it's a good way also to do it. And in general, also GVAL, it's good when you repeat evaluation several times, even without these frameworks on your own. Uh, uh, if you do it with some small temperature or with zero temperature. So you can, um, you can avoid this stochasticity bit because uh, you would then normalize average your score. And if, uh, okay, some wrong answers happen, you assume that they will be pretty rare. Probabilities uh, will be, uh, probability of that will be low. And uh, you would get uh, more or less pro proper estimation. And uh, as for previous GEVAL framework, it's actually it's a consequence of GPT score framework, and the both they are used for any kind of criteria that you can come up with for your product, for your task. Uh, for the next frameworks, uh, you need the demo specific for RAG. It's it's called retrieval augmented generation approach. I think quite a lot of you should heard about that. Let's check. How many of you heard about RAG? Almost everyone, yeah. I think it's uh, another popular word or phrase of this year, because at every co conference, developer conference, people are talking about RAG. It was not like last year, what I noticed, but that's good because everyone wants to integrate this approach of uh, answering to questions. But for those of you who are not familiar, I can qu quickly introduce. So. Uh, you have some knowledge base. Uh, actually, it might be a set of documents. Then you just split them into chunks in some way. And for each chunk, you use a bedding model to compute some vectors that are semantic representation of for each chunk. And you put together chunks and vectors into some knowledge base. And then when you need to answer a question that comes from a user, what you do, you compute the same vector of representation for this query, for this question. And then by this vector, you extract uh, k, the most similar other vectors, and their corresponding chunks. And for that, you use some approximate uh, k nearest neighbors ne method, for example. And uh, then you have these k chunks. You form some kind of context from them. You can just join them together. 
and then you take original question, this context, and you ask LLM to answer this question by relying on context. And you get answer and response. And this uh, illustration is very simple way of implementing RAG. It's called naive RAG as well because um, not always it works properly. You need some other techniques to come around and you just, uh, if you really want to implement this on production, sometimes you need to do much more around. But it's the simplest way that you can start with and so, and for such RAG, uh, approach, you can use some preworks that help you to do evaluation. One of them is called RAGES. Uh, actually, what it does, in RAG you have three components. You have question, context, and generated answer. And for each uh, pair, you can make a metric. For example, for answer and question, you can uh, come up with a metric that is called answer relevance. It just estimates how answer is relevant to the question. Also, you can come up with context relevance when you check context versus question. And uh, if you check answer versus context, uh, you can come up with faithfulness. Here, um, there is illustration that shows that you can call LLMs, it's uh, their blue, blue circles here, to do some tasks. And you also, uh, for answer relevance, you call a betting model to compute embedding vectors and then to rely on some similarity. I won't go deeper into that because you can always read uh, about this rework. I will just explain maybe one case. For example, if you want to compare answer versus context to estimate faithfulness, how answer is supported by context. Do you have something extra in the answer that maybe some hallucinations? Uh, what can you do? You can ask LLM to generate some statements, some main points from this answer, like a list of statements. And then uh, you can check uh, if, uh, like in, in a loop, you can check if each statement is supported by context, is reflected by context, for example. And then if you compute a rate, number of supported statements divided by total number of generated statements, you get some estimation of faithfulness in this framework. And other, they compute it in quite similar way. And one more framework that is also quite interesting, it's called ARIS, uh, Automated Rack Evaluation System. It's, uh, it's, it is made by researchers from Stanford. Um, it's more interesting in terms of that uh, I think it's a better way uh, because you use uh, trans smaller transformer models as scorers, but it uh, requires more effort from you because you need to prepare some data set, you can, should do some training. And uh, so let's just quickly observe it for now. Uh, first, you need First step is to, to generate some synthetic data set. You also come up with some passages, passages the context, just some, some chunks that you have. Uh, you then, uh, you also come up, you need to provide some few short prompts, examples, and they use together to generate uh, triplets. It's question, context, and answer. And then uh, these triplets, they are used as a second step to uh, fine-tune three uh, models. They're already pre-trained, but you can fine-tune them on your specific domain knowledge. Uh, and uh, each uh, model is just scoring on one of three dimensions. Like we have these three metrics here, relevancy between uh, uh, answer relevance, uh, context relevance, and faithfulness. So you uh, make one transformer, one scorer per, per metric, and you fine-tune them. And then you can use them just um, because they're ready, or you can also uh, get some confidence uh, interval estimations using uh, prediction powered inference methods. Uh, for that, you need some uh, validation data set. You need to provide 150 data points, at least the more the better. And uh, this approach works uh, for RAG. You, you can use the scorers to get these value estimations. Um, 
And you can modify it a bit, like you can provide more training data, you can replace synthetic data maybe with your data if you have it, also possible. And this approach, when you use some transformers, some scorers, it might be used in, a, in another field. So you can estimate coherence, for example, you can estimate healthfulness, whatever, instead of using LLM, you can use smaller transformer models that is specifically uh, retrained and fine-tuned, or you, you trained it uh, just for specific criterion, uh, specific metric. And I, I think that it's, uh, like for me, this approach sounds much better than previous, but it requires, as you understand, much more effort uh, to use it on practice. And as for evaluation, you can do it on task level, as we previously described, and uh, which tasks uh, you can have. You can have something like binary classification, multi-class classification. You can ask model to do some sentiment analysis, it's also some kind of classification. Or you can ask model to detect uh, language, it's also classification, or um, country, and so on. Or you can uh, evaluate retrieval part of rock and or you can evaluate synthesis part of rack summaries and so on. For the most situations, if you have labels, uh, label data, data set, evaluation is uh, quite simple because in data science, uh, in machine learning, you already have uh, some well-known metrics, um, like for classification, for ranking, and you can use them. Uh, for some other cases, you can use some something like the statistical approach, for example, here you can use metrics um, that uh, they were brought uh, for evaluating translations originally, but they also might be uh, useful for, uh, for other cases, like for generating summaries. But frankly speaking, uh, th this well, like blue rush and meteor, they are not so correlated. Uh, with human evaluations, uh, like uh, if you use uh, uh, LLM as a judge approach. But they can also show you some, some proxy, like uh, some indica indication what, on what happens with your summaries. And, and so they also can be employed. But if you don't have labels, what happens pretty often, uh, you, you can use uh, this rack approach, uh, these metrics that are covered here, uh, some of them were already uh, uh, checked in Ragus, uh, and for uh, and some other, they, they they can also be easily described. Uh, for summarization, you can come up with estimation of relevance, coherence, so on, and for any other kind of text generation that is specific for your task, you can also bring some some dimensions uh, that you want to evaluate. In, in, in order to ensure that your responses are correct. Um, then, uh, how to create a data set? Of course, ideally you need to use your production data and then to, to make it quite diverse, to cover some different cases. And then, if you would like to go with labeling, you should do that and you can start with LLM. Why not to ask LLM to to do classification for you. You can use your model from production even that you have. You can double check uh, your labels using self-reflection just by asking again model as, as a judge to ask it uh, like yes or no whether it's correct or not. And then, of course, uh, ideally you need humans to double check that your evaluations are correct and you can mostly fo focus humans uh, on the cases, for example, when self-reflection doesn't work. But ideally, it's better to check everything. And just for evaluation, you just bring some data set. Usually, it's um, maybe uh, 100, 200 data points, or maybe more or less, depending on the case. And it's quite feasible uh, to do. And then, if you have these data sets, you ideally, as in the machine learning, you need to split it in training and um, evaluation, validation parts, because you can. Uh, you can come up, you can bring overfitting just uh, by looking into some data set and adjusting your prompt. You can overfit your prompt uh, to this data set and there's a chance that it won't work uh, on another data. That's why, like, like we do it in a data science way, it's better to use the splitting. 
And for end-to-end -end evaluation, usually, as I said, it's more specific to your product. Here I provide examples uh, of summary generation for customer support and reply generation. And uh, there we use um, metrics uh, that are business-specific. Uh, so it's uh, language correctness, semantic correctness, it's completeness of um, summary and appropriateness of responses and so on. So, and when you come up with your metrics, you, you need to make them highly correlated with human evaluations. And it's uh, quite tricky to do that. Not always possible because some of your business metrics that may, might be originally existed in your company, they might be very subjective, requiring some data. But if you just leave the most important metrics that you can implement for that you, for which you don't need extra data, uh, you can sometimes increase uh, this rank correlation quite high, and then you can rely on these metrics instead of like in, in addition to humans, I would say. And for observability tools, uh, uh, it's like you have LLM, you can do evaluation, but imagine uh, something happens, something bad happens to, you see that you evaluated your summaries, and it's end-to-end -end evaluation, but uh, inside you have a lot of different tasks that are happening, that you perform, and you know it's failed, but uh, how to understand why it failed and what happened? For that, of course, you need some monitoring. Ideally, you can use LLM observability tool that uh, collects the traces, all the calls to LLMs, to uh, chains, maybe some functions, function calls. And then, usually these tools, they provide some web interface where you can go and do some filtering. You can check whether some errors happen, some, some grouping, and it really helps you to do debugging. And also, usually these tools, they provide some data sets. Uh, they can have some minor evaluation, but usually they say that they are evaluation agnostic, and you can just make evaluation on your own and store evaluation results inside the tool, and they can be visualized uh, on the site. And on the right, you can see some of the famous uh, observability tools. And at our company now, we do some kind of comparison of the tools to understand what we I uh, would like to use, so we are selecting now, and I would recommend you to do the same and pick what works the best for you. It could be some open source or some proprietary uh, tools as well. And now it's some demo time, and um, I have some QR code if you would like to check that later. So I give you a couple of seconds to scan. And it's a, it's a QR code that le leads you to GitHub. But for me, I will just quickly uh, go to uh, Collab. So first demo, it will show how we can use RAGS framework uh, to evaluate uh, RAG. So I can't use company data for obvious reasons. And I can't use internal tools that we use. That's why I brought open source tools here and some some data that is publicly available. So we install uh, Ragus, we install some other stuff like LinkChain, OpenAI, and so on. And then uh, I provide open API, open AI API key. And then, so I download some terms and conditions. It's uh, our six terms conditions. It's just some PDF, a legal PDF, uh, that contains a lot of information, and I would like to make rack out of it. How can I do it? First, uh, I load it, I split into chunks using recursive uh, character text splitters. Sorry, I will be fast because time is going out. So, and uh, then, and then I can uh, employ method. Uh, um, it's a part of Ragas uh, that helps you to generate uh, triplets, question, answer, and piece of context, and use some of piece of context. And for that, we just create a generator that is a part of Ragus framework. We provide a model for generation, it's GPT 3.5, model for uh, evaluation embeddings model, then some parameters, what kind of question modifications. Uh, this is some approaches that 
evolutionary modify equations. You have simple equation, you can evolutionary adjust it to make it more like for, more complicated, like for reasoning with some conditions, uh, equations that has different contexts. It's quite um, interesting approach. I would not um, uh, talk more about that. And when you have a data set, actually you have question, context, ground truth value, and some other stuff like about what kind of relation it was. And when you have this data set, what can you do? Uh, you can uh, run your rack pipeline on it. Here again, it's for them something simple. I just bring Faiz uh, vector store. I uh, create database uh, from chunks uh, that I split it before. Then I create a retriever that extracts just one document, again for demo purposes. Uh, then retrieval QA I create from this. I use, an, I use stuff approach. And then, um, and then, so I make answers, and these answers, they just answer this, that questions that were generated. And uh, I just add uh, answers as a new column to data set by just extending my data frame. And then I can launch evaluation. What I do, I just call evaluate function from Ragus, provide data set with these answers because I need it. And I specify three metrics that we were talking about in the Ragus framework. And what I have, OK, I have the values. So uh, more is better, like from 0 to 1. It's usually so closer to, to 0 is better. So relevancy, OK, pretty low. Faithfulness also. Mm, and uh, relevancy, answer relevance is not so good. So, And you can debug easily. You can call result to pandas and get data frame in on a data point level, you can see what happens. And another notebook I want to show to you, it's uh, how you can evaluate your summaries, again, using some uh, LLM approach. And if you're interested, uh, you can check GitHub repo. Uh, I will just uh, not focus for that for now, for sake of time. Let me switch back to slides. What happens? Uh, something happened. OK, sorry. Uh, from current slide. And uh, conclusion will be, so you need, uh, in your case, for your LM application, come up with right metrics, right data set, approaches that you use. You can employ already existing frameworks uh, that are available open source, or you can buy something proprietary. Also, ideally, it's, it's great to combinate it uh, with LM observability tool. And you need to set up uh, online and offline evaluation that suits your case. And thank you for your attention. Uh, if you'd like to contact me, you have a QR code, and please ask your questions. Thank you. So some time for questions. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, definitely got me curious about trying uh, Ragas. It's uh, good stuff. Now, allow me, allow me a contrarian question, just for fun. Uh, who watches the watchman? So when you build an evaluation system based on LMs, oh, you got to evaluate it somehow. Uh, don't you think? So how do you evaluate the evaluation system that is built how, on LMs? How you evaluate evaluation system? <laughs> well, it's an interesting question. Yeah, of course, you evaluate it on human evaluations. But so you need to match your evaluations that are made by LLM, for example, automatic, or st st statistic uh, values, you evaluate them versus what make your humans. And of course, humans can be also, they can bring some errors, biases. That's why, ideally, you need to reduce these biases, for example, by averaging. And then you can compute some kind of, for example, uh, um, you can uh, compute, uh, for example, Pearson correlation or rank correlations, and if you have it quite high, rank correlation, it means that your evaluation order of evaluations that you have, it's uh, in your LLM, it's use human evaluation, and uh, also you can check errors when there, there are mismatches, and you can debug them. Again, you can ask humans on human side, and you can check LLMs with reasoning field or why. Did LLM come up with that? And of course, when you build evaluation system, you do it iteratively. You come up with first ver version of prompt, you try to enhance it, to increase red correlation, and so on. 
And if you see it's, it's still pretty low, you can't use, of course, this prompt and do evaluation this dimension. Maybe you would start using something else. So that's why uh, for your case, it's better to test several approaches. It's still this field is not set up as everything in uh, Gen AI uh, field and v v v you, you need to try, yeah. Thank you for your question. Uh, just to build on uh, what my colleague asked, if you have to have humans evaluating the evaluator in the first place, is there a big gain from that as opposed to just having humans evaluating your model in the first place? Uh, you mean evaluation of which model? Because you said that if you are going to evaluate your evaluator, then you have to use humans to evaluate the evaluator. Uh, um. But what is the advantage of that compared to just uh, using those humans to evaluate your uh, original model that you're trying to evaluate with your you, evaluator? You do not evaluate, <laughs> uh, evaluate directly. What you do, you bring some metrics. Uh, they might be already existing in your company, how relations done before. Or you just bring them from scratch, it's also possible. You ask, uh, you, you make some data set, like set of inputs, and you ask uh, humans to do evaluation uh, on this data set. And you do the same separately by evaluator. So you evaluate uh, data, actually, mm. and responses that you have, inputs, outputs, for example. And then you do comparison, you make comparison, like rank correlation. So, and it's indirect way of evaluating. Actually, you compare how both work separately on the same data. So, I, I guess for all of you who are not robots, uh, there's a get together where you can ask Peter all the questions and uh, critics and whatever. And because uh, climate control is running wild, I would say <laughs> thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Peter. And thank have you. a great get together with a beer or two. <laughs> <laughs>